there's a lot of woke women's basketball player. There's a lot of woke folk around women's basketball. Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird, Megan Rapinoe, we'll just say by sex, is hanging around with Sue Bird. So by sex, she's involved in women's basketball. The woman athlete has to force feed us. They do. They have to force feed us. Megan Rapino has to tell us how great she is. Sue Bird has to tell us how we're all supposed to live our lives. And I don't even know what the hell Diana uh, Taurasi, I don't know what the hell she is. But anyway, Caitlin Clark has succeeded by just being an athlete and being unapologetic. Now, the other day, though, let me give a caveat to this. Caitlin Clark is doing Caitlin Clark stuff. And I thought this was really funny because I got to tell you, I never saw this in the men's game. She's acting like a clown. She's going into her LeBron James thing where she's giving the hands, the just, just. She's giving them all those things. Yeah, way, 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 way. And finally, her father up in whatever row her father is, just yells at her, stop complaining, and yells at her, coach, take her out. That's right. That's her dad. Her dad essentially sacked up. That's right. And I know it offends all the little girls out there, all the little girl reporters. See, this is why we shouldn't have men involved. Oh, shut up, all of you. You're giving me gas. And it's also why everyone, I don't care who you are, man, woman, dog, cat, needs a strong male influence in their life. Now, did she stop complaining? Oh, hell no. But you know what? It embarrasses the hell out of her. Her dad's probably just sitting there going, yeah, I don't care. I mean, you're acting like an idiot. You know, it doesn't take much for a father to say to his daughter to straighten the daughter up. My daughter and I, I'll just give her a look. And next thing you know, she'll do anything. Clean the car, shovel snow. No, but it's good. But anyway, back to the greatness that is Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark doesn't have to be a dumbass. Caitlin Clark doesn't have to be an idiot. Caitlin Clark can just go out there and ball. She doesn't have to show up with shades in a boom box and acting like she's all that yo. And her, I swear, not gay, but maybe is partner Sue Bird doesn't have to tell us everything we're supposed to know about basketball because he, she don't know squat about men's basketball. But anyway, let's get to Caitlin Clark. Here's Caitlin Clark talking about ball. I don't know. There's been like a lot of little moments, I think. Um, I think just the crowds at our games, but also just like the people screaming and like wanting our autographs, like like people just scream my name constantly and I think that's something that really never gets older something you never take for granted I think even like when you're out and about like doing your own things living your personal life the people that come up to you and like really support your team and understand the game um, I think that's the coolest thing but I think also just in general like the excitement around this tournament like it's super cool like people are more excited about the women's side than men's side and I think that's obviously something that's really never been the case before and it's cool to see how it's evolved like when I first started this, when I was a freshman, like we couldn't even use the March Madness branding, and now to see this, and really, it's it's just taken a whole nother level, and I continue it. I expect it to continue continue to grow this year, and I think that's the coolest thing for myself. Yeah, see, here's the thing you get into though. Women are always trying to compare it to the men. Let me tell you something: men's ratings are off the charts. So I get it. You can say that, and because during this particular time, you're Caitlin Clark, we're all supposed to listen to you. And that's what happens. You're all supposed to listen to Caitlin Clark right now. It's like Zach Eady. I mean, we got to pay attention to his mother. His mother gets on the microphone at senior day. I've had enough of his mother. But we got to listen for another couple weeks, and then he goes and plays six minutes a half in the, in the NBA. Caitlin Clark will have to listen to for another two or three years. At least I will, because she'll come to Indianapolis, and all these Iowa people will come in. It'll be a good story, and it'll be fine. We've got about two years of Caitlin Clark left. Got about three weeks of Zach Eady and his mother left. And frankly, I like them both. No, I don't. I've had enough of Eady and his mother. Edie could have been very nice. Edie acts like he is one of those fake tough guys, although I think Edie is very tough. He gets the hell beat out of him. But Caitlin Clark seems to be very nice. She seems to understand the business side more than anyone. We didn't even need to use the logo three years ago. Who knows that as a college kid? But I will tell you this. She's wrong about the whole men's thing. I don't care either way. It doesn't matter to me. I watch what's on. But the men's tournament, 
Well, frankly, it's the highest drawing tournament in a long, long, long time. Now, I assume this is going to offend women because you have to be over the moon for the women's game or else, well, you're a clown. I mean, if you're not so crazy about it and say it's the greatest thing ever, women come at you, well, come at me all you'd like. It's not great hoops. I mean, the lady at USC, fantastic. Caitlin Clark, great. But the jump balls and the falling down and the shooting the ball on the other side of the rim, we got to get better at that. But anyway, Caitlin Clark has done exactly what I started this show saying. You know, she's not the angry lesbian. She isn't trying to make a social statement about her status, you know, who she's having sex with, being a power lesbian. She simply seems like a college woman that's playing great, that has, because of all that's thrown at her, she has become broader, meaning she understands the business of it more. That's what I see. Could be wrong. But the others, the Rapinos of the world, the Tarassis of the world, (coughs) the Sue Birds of the world, frankly, I lift the cheek. I do. Caitlin Clark seems to be growing the game. Caitlin Clark seems to be growing the sport, growing the sport for young women. The other three, Tarasi, Bird, and Rapino, try to grow their own. They're trying to grow their brand. They're trying to be power lesbians. Look at us. Look at me. Yeah, Caitlin Clark's got a lot of that on the court. But off the court, that, ain't, that does not seem to be her. And much respect, yo. Much respect to Caitlin Clark for balling. Now, here's the other thing. This reminds me of Cam Newton back in the day. Cam Newton back in the day when his dad was trying to sell him to the highest bidder, it became a national story, and everywhere Cam Newton went, microphones were in his face. And Cam Newton handled it great. He wasn't trying to be the power heterosexual. He wasn't trying to be Cam Newton now where he wears, I don't know, a pink fedora, a hat with a feather in it. No. Cam Newton just then was just trying to win a national championship, and he did while smiling at everybody, while handling it all. And that's what Caitlin Clark's trying to do. Doesn't seem to be an outside agenda with Caitlin Clark, other than here we go, I'm playing, and I got to answer these questions after. And she seems to be all in on the women's game, and I'm down with that. You know, as much as she is a self-promoter on the court, but that's fine, that's part of swag, she doesn't seem to be that off the court. And I can get down with that. These other three, you can have them. I've I don't give a damn if you, who you're having sex with. Don't care. I don't walk around telling you who I'm having sex with. I don't care, and I didn't as a player. Well, you know, I'm a heterosexual. That's currently having sex with a cheerleader. Now, but these power lesbians give me gas. Thank God for Caitlin Clark. Thank God. She's just out there balling. She's just out there playing. She's out there growing the game, and while she's doing it, is becoming one hell of a business woman. All right, now, speaking of, of promoting yourself, speaking of it being all about me, which, let's be honest, we respect on this show. We respect self-promotion. I mean, why wouldn't we? I mean, damn, every day I wake up, my first thing I do is start promoting this show. I start putting out who's going to be on, when they're going to be on, what we're going to talk about, a picture of something, because somebody told me if you add a picture, you get more views. Fine. So we are all about self-promotion, and nobody promotes themselves more than Kim Mulkey, the basketball coach at LSU, national champion, as a national champion coach, very good coach, very good player, Olympian, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying. She wears the elaborate peacock outfit. She does all the stuff that says, hey, look at me. All right, fine. Well, the Washington Post apparently for a couple of years has been digging around. Digging around and digging around Kim Mulkey. Now, here's the deal. They want to do a hit piece on her. This is what I've always said. A hit piece is good for business. <clears throat> Once Greg Doyle put a hit piece out on me, my ratings went through the roof. They just did. Here's the other deal with a hit, hit piece. you got to piss some people off. And I'm telling you right now, if you were in the newsroom at the Indy Star or the newsroom at the Washington Post, and you looked at those cretins in there, those crumb-stained, pizza-stained, low-life, never had a job, never did nothing worth a damn that are sitting in that newsroom, you'd be like, wait a second. I pissed these people off? That eh, good. Good. Third thing, a hit piece. You know what? 
it brings attention to the sport. At least in this case, it will. So Kim Mulkey's all a flutter. Apparently, the Washington Post has been digging around Kim Mulkey for a couple years. Now, here's what a hit piece could be. If somebody had any uh uh-uhs, you know what they would do? You could write a 10-part essay in the paper on the good stuff that I do. You could. You could write a 10-piece essay, a good essay, a good hit piece on how I've lived my life. Yeah, there have been hiccups. What the hell? But that's the way the world works. You could do the same thing with Kim Mulkey. You could do the same thing with anyone. But reporters are so sleazy and jealous that they want to go the other way. I mean, all you got to do, the guy that wrote it on me, Greg Doyle, is look at his face. I mean, just look at him and you know the deal. Well, Kim Mulkey is fighting this, and good for her. I got no problem. Everybody should be allowed to handle things the way that they want to handle things. I can't stand, not can't stand, I don't respect Greg Doyle, the guy that wrote it. I couldn't respect him before, so I can't stop making fun of him. It's just who I am. Well, Kim Mulkey, she's taking on a different approach. She's suing everyone. She's coming back at him. She's going to bust that ass, yo. So Kim Mulkey, well, she ain't happy. And a reporter asked her after LSU's game Sunday if Mulkey and her team had externally felt like maybe you were distracted a touch by Kim Mulkey's tirade. Uh, I don't know. Corey Diaz with uh, USA. Here's what she had to say. Corey Diaz with the USA Today Sports Network. Kim, obviously not the start that you guys wanted today. Just wanted to ask if externally, if you guys felt like you maybe were distracted a touch and, and just talk about how your team was able to, to just weather that, that early start. No, listen, man, I'm not, we're not going to let one sleazy reporter distract us from what we're trying to do. Absolutely not. My kids didn't even know I said that yesterday. That team's not involved in this. They were in shock when they saw all that on the internet. I don't take that stuff to my team. Um, was that the question, or did you have a second part? I like her. I mean, these guys are such jackasses. Kent Babb is the reporter's name. Good for Kent Babb. Kent Babb is, I got I I can hear it. I got to get her. I got to get her. I got to get her because, well, you know, I'm mad. I'm going to find out what's going on down there. They're winning too much. They're too angry. Can you imagine? Kent Babb. All right. She also talks about how this is part of the game. Here's Kim Mulkey. Here's some more. Unfortunately, this is part of a pattern that goes back years. I told this reporter two years ago that I didn't appreciate the hit job he wrote on Brian Kelly. And that's why I wasn't going to do an interview with him. After that, the reporter called two former college coaches of mine and left multiple messages that he was with me in Baton Rouge to get them to call him back. Trying to trick these coaches into believing that I was working with the Washington Post on a story. When my former coaches spoke to him and found out that I wasn't talking with the reporter, they were just distraught. And they felt completely misled. Former players have told me that the Washington Post has contacted them and offered to let them be anonymous in a story if they'll say negative things about me. The Washington Post has called former disgruntled players to get negative quotes to include in their story. They're ignoring the 40 plus years of positive stories that that people or they have heard from people about me. But you see reporters who give a megaphone to a one-sided embellished version of things aren't trying to tell the truth. They're trying to sell newspapers and feed the click machine. This is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. It's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of. I'm fed up and I'm not gonna let the Washington Post attack 
this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. Yeah, well, there you go. I could have told you what the guy looked like. I could have told you. I could have told you. And by the way, this guy went to South Carolina. By the way, this guy went to their rival. Look, she's right. Hey, you could write anything you want that's positive about what Kim Mulkey's done. You don't have to like Kim Mulkey. You don't have to like her. You don't have to think that she's great. You don't. You don't have to think any of it. But you that's your choice. And so a guy who is a writer from South Carolina, their rival with the Washington Post, decides to write a hit piece. See, again, you may say, well, Dan, South Carolina has nothing to do with it. Maybe not. Don't know. But I got to believe as sleazy as guys like Doyle, as sleazy as guys like this guy appears to be, I got to believe that that has something to do with it. I got to believe. Why does the Washington Post care about Kim Mulkey? What are they going to say? She didn't support Brittany Griner? Who cares? Nobody should support Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner, my ass. What are you talking about? I supported Brittany Griner. I did. I was the first one. Like, wait, why isn't this woman out of jail yet? Now, are you going to give up one of the world's most dangerous men for her? I don't know. If Brittany Griner was a white war hero, would you get her out? Obviously not. But she's a black lesbian ball player. So you got to get her out. Hey, if Kim Mulkey didn't support that, what do you want me to tell you? I don't know. If Kim Mulkey's mean to her players, what do you want me to tell you? What are you really going to write about her? Like, what are you really going to write about her? I mean, my hit piece was because, oh, I don't know, I defended a young family down in New Albany or wherever they're, Scottsburg, Indiana. And I was mean to a school board that turned out to be really corrupt. Oh, no. What Kim Mulkey really do? I mean, let's think about that for a second. What do you think she really did? I mean, is she a three-time axe murderer? You think she went out and embezzled hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars? What, 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 oh, was she mean to her players? Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Did she say bad words to her players? Oh, my God, the horror. I mean, seriously. Like, I, I get a kick out of these things. Like, what, what are you really mad about? That's the thing you focus on. Sometimes next time you read a hit piece, just what are you really mad about? And you'll see that it's all a bunch of crap. So if I'm Kim Mulkey, I like what she's doing. I like that she's getting out ahead of it. I like that she's not afraid to stand up there and take this on. Now, Obviously, what she's done is she's made people more interested in reading said article, and that's cool, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Dockage can't find anybody to put him in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he just went in the Hall of Fame. Dockage can't do, okay, wrong. Mulkey can't, okay, so what? No, it's great. We need more hit pieces. It'd be nice one time, though, with somebody in the public eye that you don't like. Look, I'm not talking about pandering. I'm not talking about somebody in the public eye that you do like. I'm talking about it'd be nice if someone in the public eye that a writer or somebody didn't like, you got to know them, and maybe you figured out what makes them tick, not just that list. Boom, 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 boom. And, of course, the made-up list that gets put in there. Hey, Kim, you keep fighting. You keep fighting them because they're sleazy, they're dirty, they're ridiculous, and frankly, they go unchecked. You keep checking them. Speaking of checking them, I kind of, sort of told you this. Kind of, sort of. I said in the NCAA tournament there would be some upsets early. I mean, I didn't know who. Auburn gets beat. All right. But then I told you, chalk. Chalk would rain. And Chalk pretty much has rain. And I also got to tell you, the teams that are the Chalk beat the living dog out of the teams that were just okay. Case in point, Purdue. You know, I sat on this couch the other day with a good friend of mine that came to town. He and I played high school basketball together. I went to Indiana. He went to Purdue. 
He lives in Logan or outside Logan in Paradise, Utah. Utah State is right there. You go buy it when we went to play golf. In fact, when I went to visit him and my wife and I went to visit he and his wife, we played golf and part of the golf course is on Utah State's campus. So he has a unique perspective. We're watching Utah State beat the living hell out of TCU. And I'm like, huh, Utah State's pretty good. Utah State might have a chance. No. When I say no chance, I mean Utah State started out with no chance. And then it got worse. Now, had really nothing to do with Utah State. I mean, it was obvious five minutes in that Utah State was going to have to play a damn near perfect game to hang with the Boilers. Why? Because the Boilers are balling. The Boilers are getting it done. Like, the Boilers are not jagassing around. I mean, they're throwing it inside. Uh, Lawyers making mid-range shots. The kid, Kaufman Wren, decided he was going to ball so hard, he got on the backboard early and often. Ended up with 18 points. And anybody, and Matt Painter said it, anybody that thinks, even for a second, that Edie is only good because he's big is nuts. Anybody that thinks Edie's only got one trick pony is crazy. He's a seven-foot whatever guy that can make free throws. He can turn to his right shoulder. He can turn to his left shoulder. His jump hook has great touch. He can shoot the basketball with touch. His wrist from here to here is fantastic. And not a lot of biggins have that. Think Shaq. But the fact of the matter is he's the most dominant player that we've seen in our lifetime. Not in my lifetime, probably your lifetime. He is. The dude just goes nuts, and then he sits 21-11 and 11 in the first half. Now, I'm not going to tell you that, you know what, he's the best player I've ever seen in college. Bill Walton was pretty good. He went 21-22 in the national championship game against a bunch of pros. But see that right there? That's pretty good. Only scored two points in the second half because that's all he had to. Ended up with 23 and 14. The game against Grambling, he went for 31 and 21. And nobody said a word. I don't give a damn if you're doing it against me, Dylan, both Knicks, Aaron, and Gary. You go for 31 and 21, you are balling. No, you're really balling. You're crazy balling. And that's what they did. That's what he did. So don't at me about it, people. Don't at me. And Purdue survived, and now everybody say, well, the ghosts are gone. No, they're not. No, they're not. You lose this next one, the ghosts are right back. Tennessee and Texas. Oh, man, a sigh of relief. I would argue Texas worst coach team in America. I would argue Tennessee's one of the best coach teams in America. Well, I might be arguing with myself because they're pretty good. They're pretty good. No, they're really good. All right, here's the deal. Tennessee looks good enough to me that the Purdue-Tennessee game is going to be dynamite if, in fact, it is a Purdue-Tennessee game to go to the Final Four. If it gets to the Purdue-Tennessee game, then guess what? People are going to be pretty happy. Why? Well, Because one coach, whether it's Barnes, who has been to a Final Four, or Painter, and Purdue, who haven't been since 1980, one of them is going to be happy. And I like both coaches, so I hope they're happy. Clemson and Baylor. Clemson just decided to get in a stance and guard. Clemson was not jag-assing around. Clemson sat in a stance. Clemson moved their feet. It was one of the best defensive performances I've seen. I was dumb enough to bet Baylor a few minutes in, and I didn't watch. That was stupid because as soon as I watched, I thought, oh, boy. Now, Baylor had a chance, missed two free throws, a freshman kid who's, I guess, a good player, he missed a couple free throws or the game would have been tied down the stretch and Baylor fell apart. But don't sleep on Clemson. Clemson's got some big, strong kids, and they'll guard you. Don't sleep on them at all. UConn, Danny Hurley said after the game, hey, NCAA's making this hard on us. NCAA don't like us. Well, you know what? He ain't wrong. The NCAA don't like you. I don't know. All they did was put former Final Four teams in their bracket, last year's Final Four teams. All they did was say, hey, we're going to put the champs from the Big Ten, Illinois, tournament champs, Auburn, although they got beat, all right, Iowa State in their bracket. 
Danny Hurley ain't lying. Danny Hurley and UConn have the hardest road to the Final Four. And yesterday, it started with Northwestern. Now, people say that are my age, well, what do you mean? Northwestern stinks. No, 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 no. no. This is not your father's Northwestern. So stop it, Stoop. Boo Boo is dangerous. Northwestern looked pretty good, but I got to tell you, UConn smacked them around like the old Northwestern. UConn went out and beat them like, well, frankly, the Northwestern of the 70s, the 80s, most of the 90s. They did. They did. Dusty May, our friend, friend of the show, Dusty May, has got a five year deal. He'll be introduced on Tuesday at a press conference as a new head coach of. The Michigan Wolverines. I texted with him the other night. I said, hey, man, if these rumors are true, congratulations. And he was all excited, and he should be. Michigan's a great school. Michigan, in the world of NIL, should be a dominant program in basketball. But I'll tell you one thing I guarantee you Dusty May's going to have to do when he gets in there. He's going to realize there's a lot of crap that went against winning. Here's the thing with Jawan Howard. Jawan Howard was great to everybody in that athletic department except for, of course, John Sanderson. Uh, according to my friends that are there, my son's friends that are on the women's staff, Jawan Howard was awesome to everyone. In fact, Jawan Howard was out supporting the women's program the other day. But I guarantee you Dusty May's going to get in there and go, what in the hell is this? What is this? What are we? What? Darren DeFreeze, the coach at Drake, is going to head in to West Virginia as the head coach there. Good luck to Darren. I was the head coach of West Virginia for eight days. And I hope, and I think it's true, that the West Virginia organization, the athletic director, the president, the whole deal is a lot better than when I was there. Now, I'm not going to rip anybody. I've done enough of that, and they've done enough of that to me. But I like West Virginia, or I would not have taken the job there. I like the whole thing. I like the, I like the school. I like where it was. I like the state of West Virginia. Always have, always will. And Darren DeFreeze got himself a big-time job. Now he's going to have to go out and do it. He's going to bring his son with him, who I thought was probably a first-round pick. Uh, He did not look that way to me, although he's damn good. I don't know what a first-round pick is. I don't know what a first-round pick isn't. My son's roommate was uh, Duncan Robinson. Duncan Robinson's the fastest man to 1,000 threes in NBA history. If you'd have told me Duncan Robinson was going to break NBA records, I'd have told you you're crazy. So who knows? And I wish them all the best. I think it's two good guys with two good hires, and I hope Drake hires Marty Richter. Marty's longtime assistant. Marty was my assistant. Marty was there with Dunk City, if you remember them, back at Florida Gulf Coast. He was an assistant there, and he's been an assistant at Drake. And he's damn good at what he does. So I hope that's what they do. Look at this. Tell me, tell me that there is not gremlins. Tell me that the world isn't watching. My phone just just recorded all of that. There's not a time that I said anything on my phone at all. But my phone is recording because, as you and I know, well, everybody's listening. Uh, Otani speaks today. Otani speaks today. And Otani is going to, I guess, have a new interpreter with him. I mean, I would think. Would that be great? Would that be great if Otani spoke today and he used the same interpreter that is in trouble, that has gotten him in trouble, that is the reason he has to speak today? Now, let's understand something. What you're going to hear out of Otani is not going to be anything. He's going to say, I never gambled, blah, 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 blah. And I hope he's right. I hope Otani is right, but I don't buy any of it. Remember when Tiger Woods told us he's going back to his Buddhist ways? I haven't heard a word about Buddhism, and no one's seen him in a Buddhist mosque, and he hasn't been hanging with the Dalai Lama even a little bit. So just stop it with that kind of stuff. But I'm anxious to see what happens today. Craig Carton, our friend from the Carton Show in the mornings, had something very interesting to say about gambling on Fox News. Let's hear from Craig Carton. If you're going to bet yourself out of the hole, as irrational as this may seem to a non-gambler, you're going to do it on something you know better than anything else. And in this case, from the interpreter standpoint, that would have to be baseball. Yeah. I mean, how about that? Like, if you're going to bet yourself out of a hole, you're not all of a sudden going to go bet Russian table tennis. If you're from Japan, chances are you're really not going to go bet the NBA, although maybe you will because they're very big in China. I'm guessing you're not going to go with the NFL, but Craig Carton is right. 
When you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole, and by the way, who hasn't been there? No, I haven't been that deep. Actually, I've never been really in a hole. But anyway, when you're thinking you're losing and you're going to try to win, you go back to what you know. No question about it. I thought that was very interesting by Craig Carton. I thought that was very good by Craig Carton. And if anybody knows, it's Craig. I mean, his, his gambling led to jail. And you know what? I always go to people that absolutely have the best perspective, not people that are guessing. This is going to be fascinating because there isn't a chance in holy hell. Not one chance. Not one chance that Major League Baseball wants to get involved in anything like this with Otani. The funniest thing is Otani here, Mookie Betts here. Otani Betts. That'd be pretty funny, and that's going to happen. Me personally, damn who you bet on. I don't give a damn if you bet on baseball. Don't bet on your own team. Don't bet on your own performance. Don't do that. Other than that, me personally, what do I care? Like, I thought it was ridiculous Isaiah Rogers Jr. got kicked off the Colts for sitting in the locker room making a DraftKings bet about college basketball. That seems idiotic to me, but that's the world that we're currently living in. 